The Bob Murphy Show, episode 141. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. This is going to be another fun interview. I'm talking with Dan Sanchez, who is the Director of Content at the Foundation for Economic Education, or FEE, and he's also the editor of fee.org. And the uh, immediate discussion is based on Dan's recent article at fee, where he's talking about how DC wants to quote, fix Superman, because oh, he's he's too perfect. And uh, the actual title of Dan's article is how to make Superman relevant. And so Dan disagrees with the conventional explanation that oh, yeah, the reason the Superman movies lately aren't working is that, oh, he's just too perfect. And so audiences can't relate. We got to make him brooding and dark and, you know, full of self-doubt. So regular people, and Dan thinks, no, that's that's not at all what you need to do to fix Superman, the Superman movies. And here's what, what you do need to do. So we talk about that. You may remember, and I'm going to link to all this stuff, folks, at bobmurphyshow.com slash 141, where he and I talked about his response to the movie, the, the Joker movie, they just recently came out and how Jordan Peterson actually could help the Joker if the Joker were real. And so anyway, it's a, it's a fun conversation. So if you don't, you know, if you haven't watched Superman movies, it's probably not for you. But on the other hand, let me stress, if you have watched the Superman movies and you're someone who listens to the Bob Murphy show, then you definitely do want to listen to this one. We, we really get into some deep stuff. I think in this, in this episode, I was really happy with how the conversation turned out. Last thing I'll mention is Dan alludes to a clip. So he included it in his original article that somebody, when they were watching the Infinity War, um, or no, sorry, the Endgame Avengers movie, and there's a clip in there and someone, you know, from in the theater got a bootleg version and you get the audience reaction. If you liked those movies, then I would strongly encourage you to stop listening to this right now and go to the show notes page. Again, bobmurphyshow.com slash 141 and click on and watch the video unless you're watching this on YouTube, in which case, you know, if, unless there's copyright things and they make me take it out, I'll try to embed it directly. But my point is, if you're listening to the audio of this, just for continuity's sake and whatever, we're going to include the audio in the clip, but it really doesn't do it justice. You kind of have to see it to see exactly what the audience is seeing on the screen so then when you hear the reaction, you know exactly what they're reacting to and you get all, get all fired up. Want to go out and uh, battle Keynesians or something. So in any event, like I say, uh, do yourself a favor. If that sounds appealing to you and you like those Avengers movies, you're going to really like watching this clip in terms of the video, not just hearing the audio that Dan and I will talk about in a minute. Before we dive in, two quick other things, folks. Number one is pay attention deep into the episode. I asked Dan the classic question about DC versus Marvel in particular. Why is it the Marvel movies are great and the DC ones just don't seem to be hitting? And I offer a theory. And the reason I want you to pay attention to that is because coming soon, I have Eric July on and I pose the same question to him. And let me just give you a hint. It's sort of like a study guide to the Bob Murphy show. Eric's answer is the exact opposite of what I am going to say to Dan in this one. And upon further reflection, I think Eric is right, right? So anyway, just keep that in mind. Keep your ears open. And the other thing is in the show notes page, I'm going to include a bunch of links to excerpts from the various Superman films that Dan and I discuss. And uh, in particular, I told Dan that there's handcuffs on Superman in the one scene, and and he didn't remember that. Of course there are, right? So I put put the links in there in case you want to go see the things I'm talking about. So that's all, again, at bobmurphyshow.com slash 141. And now here we go with my discussion with Dan Sanchez. Well, Dan, welcome back to the Bob Murphy Show. Hi, Bob. Nice to talk to you again. You are one of the few people, I know I had Scott Horton on at least twice, and maybe 
you might be, you're definitely one of the few people who've come back. And the, this, the key is for those who want to get on the show multiple times, just keep writing about superheroes, that that's how you get on the show. <laughs> right. So you, last you time. Two time club, like the SNL's <laughs> club. For yeah, five time. right. Right. Exactly. So yeah, last time you were on, because you wrote, wrote this fascinating article about what Jordan Peterson, like the analysis he could do, how he could have helped the Joker, um, you know, when that, when that movie came out. And then, uh, so now we're talking about, you had an article in Fee. Of course, folks, we'll link to this. It's bobmurphyshow.com slash 141 is where to find all these links, where uh, you were taking on the the popular view that, oh, the problem with Superman is he's too perfect. And so there's a narrative there and you were explaining why, no, that's not, that's not the issue. So why don't you take the reins and just summarize what you're, what you are attacking in your article and, and then we can just have a fun conversation from there. Sure. Yeah. So I really kind of think society needs a rescue right now. You know, there's Mm -hmm. a lot of crazy stuff going on. Uh, 2020 is like trying to combine like 1918 and 1938 and 1969 all in like one year. And I, I think that Superman uh, could help us. Um, so it's kind of a shame that he's kind of fallen by the wayside in popular imagination because uh, he's helped us before. Um, in 1938, when he debuted, he was hugely successful and hugely popular as a figure of hope amid the Great Depression. And uh, in World War II, he was immensely popular with the GIs and they found solace and hope and imagination in in reading his adventures. And then in 1978, in the the malaise that Carter talked about, um, Superman's movie was hugely inspirational to a lot of people. And um, and there was kind of an attempt of bringing Superman back, but it would, there were kind of a lot of disappointments. So uh, mo- most of the movies have kind of, um, the studios have not, both in terms of box office, but mostly just in terms of audience reactions that, that, that they just didn't find him very compelling. And so, so the typical response to that is like, oh, well, the problem is Superman as a character, that he's too perfect, um, both um, power, in terms of power, that he doesn't have enough uh, vulnerabilities, and so that's not interesting. And in terms of morality, that the idea that like, oh, nobody no- likes to see a story about someone who's just so untouchably perfect mor- morally. And so they try to give him feet of clay. The, they, they power him down physically, but then they also weaken him morally. And... Um, and H- I think hang that, on. So can you, yeah. can you be specific? I don't want to put you on the spot, but so I'm tracking everything you're saying. Like this all resonates with me and I agree with you wholeheartedly, but do you, do you re- like, can you give examples? Like there was the one, what was the one? And I, sh- I should have done more research on this to refresh my memory, to make the movies right. What was the one where Kevin Spacey was Lex Luthor? Uh, that was Superman Returns, I think. Okay. Cause that, yeah. that was the one where, it was it were like where he just goes up and like punches Superman and Superman f- falls down or something because they're standing on the island of kryptonite or something like that. Yeah, he, he gets thrashed because of kryptonite. And it something about that scene bothered me. Like it, it didn't seem like that's the way it would... I, it, I don't know if, if, you, if, I'm, if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, but, but I mean, it was, well, I, it was kind of, in other words, that. in in the Superman with Gene Hackman and Christopher Reeve, like that one, as soon as he opens this, you know, Gene Hackman cleverly fools him and, you know, like glances at the safe and says, oh, don't go in there. And then he opens it and there's a crypto. And Superman right away is weak and falling over. Whereas in this one, it was just goofy. It was like Superman lands and he doesn't know anything's wrong until Lex Luthor beats the crap out of him. It's like, you didn't yeah. notice that <laughs> you were getting hit with kryptonite? So, Yeah, and, and I think there's an important distinction between those two themes, uh, mm-hmm. scenes because, I mean, kryptonite has always been part of the canon of Superman. Right. And so right. even even when he was like, you know, a demigod in power is like kryptonite was always his Achilles heel. And, um, and, but there's a difference because in the, in the, in the more recent movie, it wasn't good enough for him to just have that Achilles heel trap sprung 
and then like, you know, almost die because of it. He had to like be humiliatingly beaten, um, which didn't, you know, didn't happen in the 1978 movie. And, and that's pretty common. Like in a lot of depictions of Superman, they, they just make him a punching bag now. Like even without kryptonite, they, they mm-hmm. have, they, they just have villains just, uh, like I remember the, in the justice league cartoon, it was always he, like whenever there was a blast, it, it always had to hit Superman like and and like he was always like grunting and and like mm. crying in agony from being like a, a electroshocked. And and it was always him that 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 got the, um, you know, the, the the main brunt of of any attack. And and um, and I think that like. I, th- I think that 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 is sort of a, a, a way of trying to tr- trying to knock him down a peg and, and make him more interesting, but I, I don't think it works. So okay, so I hijacked the conversation. So can you give us an example of what you mean when you said they powered him down? Like what what do you mean? Yeah. So um, they they really in the comics they powered him down in the eighties. Like he used to have like. Um, you know, cosmic powers where he could, you know, juggle planets and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. It was, I mean, it, it was more, it was more kind of a, um, almost like folk tales in, uh, in the, in the fifties and sixties, um, uh, that, that kids just loved, like that was the peak of his popularity in, in the comics. Um, and then in, in the seventies and, and in the eighties throughout comics, they, they try There was this movement of realism. Of, of just wanting to make things more gritty and, and more realistic. So, so the more like fantasy stuff, they, they, they got rid of that. And, and, and part of that was really depowering Superman down. And, um, and so then in the comics too, it was just re- this recurring thing where he was just constantly getting um, beaten and, um, and, and he, he wasn't as powerful. Like he, he couldn't do as many amazing things and um, and so that was that was a way of trying to to make him more interesting. So I, I do know what you mean. I noticed that 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 yeah, like so I you know I guess we're similar in age. Like the movies we grew up with, you know, the Christopher Reeve, Gene Hackman ones, like basically Superman one and two, and then it got kind of silly. Mm-hmm. But in those ones, you're you're right. Like so, the first one, yeah, I mean there, there was Kryptonite was because how else are you gonna deal with it? But even there, it, it was just a one shot thing where it's just a brief period of the movie where you know he's weak and then you know miss Tessmacher jumps in the pool and saves him you know showing like oh it's because of his his character that's why you know sh- that he was he was rescued not his, his superpowers but mm-hmm. yeah I, I know what you mean like when i read the flip because i didn't read the comics very much but well, yeah when i did get them and read through them i was kind of surprised that oh in the comic books bad guys can beat the crap out of super you know what i mean like, like he doesn't die except yeah. when he did but it's yeah there's ones that can hold their own whereas in the movies it was only oh so only somebody else from krypton could possibly hold their own against superman otherwise he's just head and shoulders above like that's not the issue the issue is how does he deal with a world of like is he in other words he's so far above the humans in, in the first superman movie it's unthinkable that he would like kill lex luthor like that would be a horrible sin in his mind you know what i mean because he's so far above humans that that you know he he couldn't use violence against them so that it, it, anyway um so i i noticed what you're talking about that yeah the superman in the comics was not as the stories were different it was more like he was just a really strong person not this thing that was like qualitatively higher than everybody he interacted with yeah and there and there's a a connection between like the the physical power and the moral power because um classically he would be depicted as someone who was so com- competent and capable and strong and powerful that he didn't need to kill right. um, that, that he could, that um, he could defeat the enemies with, without stooping to their level and, and that he would save Lois Lane, that he would, he, he would save people. And that, that's another like common trope in the, in the current depictions is that he's always too late. Like, like Superman is classically like in the nick of time, like he, mm-hmm. he swoops in and he, and he saves people. But now it's like there's always mass casualties and, and yeah, and 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 even worse, all those mass casualties are are partially because of his own 
um, hesitancy to to um, to act to to use his powers. That like especially in the Snyder movies, the more recent movies, he's seen he's depicted as like really internally conflicted, and um, and you know there there's the the conflict between uh, his. Crypt- Kryptonian father who told him to, to um, you know, to really use his powers to to help humanity, and uh, and his Earth father who who cautioned cautioned him to to not do that, and um, and so it's like this this struggle, and and so you know, and it's it's understandable because in in, in a lot of stories, like that's the interesting part of it is are these struggles and these tensions and, and then eventually the, the resolution of those ten- tensions. But I think what, what they miss is that that's not the only kind of story, that, that there's another kind of more aspirational hero story that you know, goes back to the ancient myths where, um, where the hero as like a platonic ideal of heroism, who who doesn't have that that conflict, and who doesn't need to fail catastrophically the way that like um, Spider Man fails when he when he lets his Uncle Ben die in order to to be to uh, to, to succeed. Um, that that's that's another kind of story, and that can be equally as powerful. Right. So you're right. Yeah, I'm thinking through it because it's. Um... In Superman Two, for example, where uh, yeah, he like he's um, against the three Kryptonians. They're fighting in New York, you know, and, and that's like this movie's building up to that, right? When finally he lands outside, and he's like, "General Zod, would you care to step outside?" And everyone's like, "Oh yes." And, but very soon, like just a little bit of damage, and then they like turn the bus and throw it at him, and he gets up and looks around, and he flies away because he realizes. I can't fight them in New York City because somebody's going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. Whereas in, and so, yeah, he is able to isolate and then they go, you know, fight him up in uh, Fortress of Solitude. And, and so he takes the battle there. Whereas, yeah, no, is it still Superman Return? What's the one? <laughs> Sorry, I, I should have done the research. Oh, Man of Steel. Man of Steel is the one where, like, Kevin Costner's his father? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that one, yeah, New York just gets obliterated at the end and then is that also the one where he has to like use his heat vision and kills general zod or something oh he breaks his neck or he breaks sorry he breaks his oh because is it general zod that's using his heat vision and he's got yeah. to snap his neck before he kills right so that yeah that one you're, you're right it's it's his limitations he he can't contain the situation everything people are dying buildings are getting smashed and yeah and he comes to a moral dilemma and finally you know does something dubious because you know what else could i do because i couldn't right. contain the situation so um anyway it, it's that is that is interesting i hadn't thought that through that because that was i noticed the difference but i hadn't thought through that okay yeah are they doing that deliberately to say oh this is a more realistic like isn't this more interesting now like yeah. know, superman isn't in charge like he he lost control of the situation right i mean it's such a grim telling because it's like you know, when Superman in the 1978 movie, when he first makes his debut, it's when he saves Lois Lane from a, a helicopter crash. Right. And so it's this like, you know, glorious, awe-inspiring, right. you know, yeah. saving day. And, and you know, the, the cape is fluttering and everybody's looking up. And <laughs> he walks out and the guy's and like, whoa, that's a bad outfit. Whoa. And he's like, excuse me, sir. <laughs> Right, like, yeah. <laughs> like, like, just showing he's still like super polite as Clark. You know what I mean? Like, excuse me, sir, I got, <laughs> I got to go do right. something. <laughs> Where, whereas in the Man of Steel, the first people to even see him are not even the public. Like, like when he makes his debut, it's it's after um, the other Kryptonians have all already um, invaded, basically, mm-hmm. and are, are are threatening the world. And and so then when he reveals himself, it's to military personnel. He like he 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 offers his help to to like the you know military industrial complex, mm-hmm. and and they're the first ones to see him. So it's like it's it's in this grimy milieu of just like national security. Yeah, yeah, is that the is that like where he goes and presents himself and they arrest him, like put handcuffs on him or something? Or am I getting mixed up? I don't remember the handcuffs, um, but but they are very 
you know, wary of him. Right, right, because isn't it that the the Kryptonians basically take Earth hostage and say, we'll leave you alone, but we want Kal-El to be delivered to us? And, or I, am, am I mixing I plot lines like up? Happen. I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the right sequence, but... Um, but yeah, but it's I, I think I think they do put him in cuffs, but um, but yeah, it's it's like this foreboding, um, you know, national security drama, like in these like dark halls, as as opposed to you know, f- flying up in the sky and like doing wondrous things that mm-hmm. that are in- inspiring and awe inspiring to to the public, and then like when when he actually makes his debut to the public, like when is seen, you know, writ large, it's, it's in amid atrocity. Like, I mean, it looks like nine 11 footage with these buildings collapsing mm, and, mm-hmm. and just mass casualties. And so it's like this huge public social trauma that the public is, right. is their first experience with Superman. Well, yeah, whereas in the 78 one, that, yeah, like, so it's been building, because his dad did give him advice in that movie where, you know, like, he shows off with the football team or whatever, and he's, oh, I, I ran home, you know, and they're like, oh, whatever, Clark, what a weirdo. And his dad's, <laughs> like, been showing off, haven't you, son? And, you know, he's like, is it is it showing off when a bird flies or something? And, and he says, I know you're put here for a reason, and it wasn't to score touchdowns. And so, you know, the the dad doesn't, the earthly dad, you know, doesn't know exactly why he was, but he knows you have powers, you're supposed to do something with them. And I don't know exactly what, but it's got to be big. Right. So, yeah. So his whole, then he goes up to the Fortress of Solitude. He learns who he is. You know, Jor-El gives him all this instruction. You know, it's forbidden for you to interfere with human history. Rather, let your leadership stir others to action. You know, he's given all this stuff. And then, yeah, it's building up. And then Lois Lane up there, that's when he decides, okay, now's the time. I got to reveal myself to the world. He saves her. He goes, he saves a 747 or something. He goes and gets a cat out of a tree and gives it to a little kid. He just does all these amazing, you know, social PR (laughs) things that everyone's like, like, wow, what a nice guy. Yeah. And he's got superpowers. (laughs) Yeah. So like you point out, his dads agreed. Like Mm -hmm. they were, they were basically giving him the same lesson that, Mm -hmm. that you, you have a responsibility to use your powers to, to help people as opposed to in man of steel where there, there was this conflict. And, and so the dads kind of represent like parts of his conscience. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, the, um, the, the original, the 1978 movie by having the dads agree, it's like he, his, his like soul is integrated. Like he, he doesn't, he's not riven by this like intense internal conflict that, that he he's, He's whole and, and integrated, um, you know, from from the beginning, basically, and um, and then it's like, okay, you know, that that's an idea, an ideal of of a certain uh, of, of of human virtue and goodness and excellence, and it's like, okay, well, how do, how would that play out in in the world? And and that's you know, interesting. That's an interesting story, and that's the Superman story. So there's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with stories that involve inner mm-hmm. conflict, but, but that's not the strength of Superman. That's, that's not what, that's not what, what matches with his, with the, his, the way he carries himself and, and his persona and his, his just like what, what, what he symbolizes in, in our imagination. And I think that's why the, these like Hamlet versions of Superman right. are fall, falling flat with people. Have you seen, Dan, the, like the old black and white, I think the guy's name is George Reeves, Superman TV show? Yes. Where, where like, he'll be, you know, fight face in the, and he'll just be standing like this and bullets will be bouncing and he'll just be like, ha, 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 you know? <laughs> like, yeah. like that's like, he's almost like cocky, but it's very reassuring. Like when he shows up, it's like Mighty Mouse, you know, here I come to save the day. Like, you know, okay, phew, everything's fine when he shows up. Right. And he's real, you, you don't have to worry that, oh, is he like a corrupt cop or something? Like, it's just clear he's going to be fine and you don't have to worry, is he going to go too far and use excessive force on the bag? No, of course he's not because he's so far above them that, yeah, everything's going to be fine. And, you're, and so you're right, like that, the, the movies captured that. Mm-hmm. I, I will, I don't want people, I will say the one asterisk is it did bother me at the end of Superman 2 when they kill all the Kryptonians when they were, had their powers removed. Yeah, I, I've read that th- that might be a little bit ambiguous. That 
that it they maybe they didn't die. Yeah, it wasn't always completely clear that when they fall, right. that they fell into like a lethal abyss. That like that maybe it was like you know just somewhere where they would get trapped or something. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that is a good point. And that, that I, I hope that's what it was supposed to be. But yeah, clearly they made it open ended, and you weren't sure what happened. But right. certainly, I as a little kid watching, I thought they were dead. So right. And then I thought, actually, Lois Lane just murdered that woman because <laughs> yeah. she said, you know what? You're a pain in the neck and slugs her and she falls. And All right. Yeah. Um, okay. So so that's the conventional. And so, oh, gee, th that didn't work. So you're saying, okay, is the number one that that was in your article, you're saying that that's not, the, 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 the your, your guys are doing it wrong. Like that's not what you're supposed to do with the Superman story. And so that's why this isn't working. And then I thought you had a brilliant, way of demonstrating that because someone could be like, oh no, Dan, you know, you're living in the past. We couldn't just keep remaking that kind of movie that worked in 1978, but it wouldn't work now because, you know, Americans are jaded and they want to have heroes who are conflicted and, and you had a pretty good counter example. Yeah. Um, Captain America in the Marvel cinematic universe. Um, I think he demonstrates that, that the kind of character that Superman traditionally is still has resonance um, and, and will always have resonance um, with with people um, because Captain America is every bit the Boy Scout as Superman tr traditionally is. Right, he, he chastises Iron Man for swearing when they're going right. into battle. <laughs> right, and um, and he's not. He doesn't have that. Like he he does he does learn. He does evolve and even get disillusioned about like the government and and things like that but his moral compass throughout is is always um you know steady and 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 like it's just a realization that the moral compass of others that he thought was also steady that that those weren't right and right. and so then it leads him into conflict with them because because he's pursuing what what he thinks is right but he's he, he's he's not like you know, struggling with, uh, you know, completely uh, uh, opposing um, um, impetuses w within himself about what's basically moral and what's basically decent. And, and, um, and yeah, and so, so, you know, there's this, th there's this um, scene in Avengers 2, where he like, where, where they're, they're taking turns trying to lift Thor's hammer, mm -hmm. because the, uh, the, the legend of, I mean, the, the story of Thor's hammer is that it's enchanted so that only the, the worthy could, can, can lift it. And like, and with the idea that only, only Thor is, is so worthy, only, only a God would be so, so worthy. And so they're all, you know, taking turns and even, even like the ones with super strength that they, they can't lift it. And then, um, and then Cap moves it and then it budges. And then, like Thor is like kind of like worried for a second, right, right. And 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 the and the joke there is that like, well, everybody knows that Captain America is is a Boy Scout. That if any if if anyone is worthy, you know that that it would be him because he's so you know morally pure, and um, and so you know they they gently rib him a, a, about that, like um like Loki, um like impersonates him and like you know, uh, in, in, as a, as a sort of a Dudley do right type type figure, but, but it's always a, a gentle ribbing. And, um, and in general, he's just, you know, that's just the way he is that he's not, he's not like mocked for it. He's not shown to be like retrograde or, um, or archaic because of it. In fact, that he is continually validated for his stalwart dedication to, to his moral principles, because he keeps being shown um, standing up to those who are pushing him to compromise, and um, and against all odds, um, winning the day, coming through, inspiring mm -hmm. others to, to to join him, and um, and then ultimately being victorious, and um, and it's. You know, worth noting that his 
his movies were really successful. Like even like among MCU movies in general, which which have just made billions of, of dollars, that his franchise was super successful. And and I think that's a testament to um to to this um to refuting this this notion that those kinds of values um don't have an appeal with modern audiences. Right. And just so a few points on that. So one is um yeah, the it's not merely that his movies, like in terms of the, the Captain America movies then versus the other types did well, but even in the Avengers, you know, when there's the whole ensemble, like he steals certain scenes. Like he's clearly one of the favorite characters. Um, so one thing is I when I saw in um which one was it? Da, da, da. What's the one I'm getting the movies mixed up. It was um the the android guy and his girlfriend, the the witch, were like getting attacked by the Thanos's henchmen, and it mm-hmm. was like after it was after the Civil War, so Captain America had been in hiding. But then yeah, that came, was in Infinity War. Okay, Infinity. Okay, yeah, is that so? They're like you know how they're getting ambushed. Yeah, and then oh, it doesn't look good, and then they throw it, and then and somebody catches it or something, and then you realize it's Captain America, and like the audience that I was saw it when just went nuts. They were like, oh, yeah. it's Cap, you know, and and so like he was clearly one of the favorite. And I saw, you know, I saw it in Houston. I mean, not that Houston's a a big city of of rebel rousers, but I mean, it wasn't like I saw it in some rural town in Idaho. Like I saw it in a big theater in a city, you know what I mean? And and those people were all fired up for him. And uh, and then we'll try. I, I think this will work to include this. This clip is so good, Danny. I'm even if I have to demonetize this episode, I'm going to do it because I want people to see this. <laughs> you embedded this clip in your thing, so why don't you just explain what it is? And hopefully, I guess for those who are well, you'll be able to hear it, folks, even if you're listening to the audio. But you should go see the video. So this is BobMurphyShow.com/slash 141 if you want to see the YouTube version or just the, I'll link to it separately. But just explain what this clip is before we play it. Sure. So Thor and Thanos. Are, are fighting. And um, Thor has like a new hammer. Um, and um, Thanos is like about to shove, like it's kind of like a hammer and an ax. And Thanos is about to like shove the ax into Thor and about uh, about to kill him. Um, but all of a sudden Thor's other older hammer, Mjolnir, of, uh, you know, the one that's enchanted so that only the worthy can um, can lift it, um, strikes Thanos and saves Thor's life. And then, and then like, you know, Mjolnir always returns to Thor. He throws it and, he, and it magically returns to him. And so you see it returning and then you see that it returns to Captain America. And then you see him holding uh, the hammer. And so this clip that just went absolutely viral, it, um, it, it has that scene and then it has like the, the audience reaction in the audience I mean, in the audio, and they just lose it. Like, it's just like... Right, right. So it's like a bootleg. Someone filmed that in the theater watching this thing when the movie first came out. Yeah, or I think it was originally that, but I think someone did like a higher quality where it was just like maybe the actual footage and then just... Oh, okay. But I'm saying that's what the audience reaction is. It's the audience watching that, yeah. Right, right. Um, And like, yeah, it's just an uproarious just... Um, expression of just like joy that you, that you hear from this this audience, uh, w- you know, w- at this moment, and 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 then Thor. So here, let's let's go ahead and, and play the clip. Okay. All right. So okay. now go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So so then that part where where Thor says like I knew it. It's like mm-hmm. he's like speaking for all of us. Like right. like we all we all knew that that he is, is worthy, that he's, he's got to be worthy. And, um, and so that, you know, then, then you see him like, um, like twirling it and doing tricks with his shield and the hammer and then like shooting lightning bolts with it. And, and, and the audience just loved it. They found it so inspiring. And, and I think again, it's because it's a validation and, uh, of, of his, his upstanding decency. And, um, and you know, you know, there people also love Tony Stark and Iron Man. He's a totally different character. He's much more flawed, mm-hmm. and, 
And what we love about seeing him is, you know, seeing him redeem himself and seeing him grow. But again, that's not the only kind of character that the Captain America character it, it, uh, makes for really good storytelling, too. Right. So I, th- I'm glad you put it that way, because that's what I was going to say, where I do eventually want to go with this is to say. I think the mistake that d- the DC writers were making is they were trying to make. Superman follow the pattern. Like they looked at the success of the Iron Man movies and were like, oh, we got to have characters like that, not realizing, no, Captain America is the model for Superman. Batman is the model for, or Iron Man's the model for Batman if you were going to go that way. You know what I mean? Like the the brooding, I mean, besides the other obvious similarities of, you know, billionaires who, you know, build cool stuff mm-hmm. to, you know, to, to enhance their, you know, the fact that they're just normal humans. Mm-hmm. Um and, and and so yeah, that that's if you if you want to make the analogy. So the point being that it's true a character who's brooding and you know morally dubious and you know because Batman does stuff like Batman does things that Superman wouldn't do, yeah. and and so you know and you, you could say well partly because he has to because he's not as strong as Superman, but also um, you know just whatever his background. So yes, that's they're right that a character like that will work. But the point is you don't do that with Superman, just like if Captain America all of a sudden started swearing and got hammered and stuff like that, meaning drinking, not using Thor's hammer, that, that <laughs> it wouldn't be like, oh, this is a side of Cap we've never seen. How interesting. It would be like, no, that's not who Captain America is. What the heck are they doing? Right. Um, okay, so a, a couple other things I want to see is I think, how do you feel about, um, given the way you're, you're saying how the character works, I think it's really important that Captain America's iconic tool is a shield as opposed to like a, a powerful gun or something like, like I think that in hand, you know, um, that makes him more like, so it's, it's not that he never kills somebody. And I'm sure he probably killed a bunch of Nazis in the world war two versions, but you get what I, you are. What I'm saying, like, it's, it's more like he's less like everybody can be like, Oh, how, how could you not like the guy? Like when he goes into bail, it's mostly with a shield to like protect against enemy onslaughts. Yeah, I think there is something about that symbolism. Uh, like Superman's S looks like a shield. Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, there, there's something about that shape that conveys solidity and strength, um, but it also conveys protection um, and as as opposed to, you know, um, aggression and, and just, you know, just wanting to, to waste people, you know. Right, and, and what he does, you know, so his character, you know, when he's like, I could do this all day, you know, whether he's a little pipsqueak or Captain America standing up against Thanos when he thought it was just him. Like he was the only one left to protect Earth from him and he just gets up, you know, his shield's broken and he's all grimy. But his point is, no, I'm always going to stand until I'm dead. I will always stand like firm as a, to absorb the onslaught. Like that's that's what he does. Right. And And that's why like another scene that he stole w- was that scene because, you know, then when, you know, it seems that all hope is, is lost, that, you know, his shield is broken, he's the last man standing, it's him against Thanos' entire army just marching towards mm. him, and, but he still doesn't give up. He still, you know, just does what's right and he just mar- marches forward, um, e- even though that it seems like it's a lost cause. Um, and then all of a sudden he hears um, this um, faint voice uh, in his earpiece, and it's Falcon. It's his. It's his ally, um, who who had you know who's like you know a, a whole bunch of heroes had basically been like re- resurrected, um, and um, and then you see like basically like a cav- cavalry charge. Of like you know his his friend and then also just a whole army of of like all the Avengers and and all these superheroes from all, all the the Marvel movies um, coming out of these portals and um, and backing him up and so again it's like a very it's it's such an awesome thrilling validation of like of his stalwart insistence on doing what's right no matter the consequences that it being um you know just 
it being validated as being the wise course of action because, you know, all these people that he's inspired, um, you know, have, have gotten his back and, um, and have, have, have saved him. Um, and, and yeah, that, that was just another part of the movie that th- those two parts of the movie probably got like the biggest cheers of the whole, mm-hmm. the whole, of whole, the whole end game. Um, yeah. While you're talking about that, I have to note, why didn't Dr. Strange have those portals open up behind the enemy lines? Like, oh, that's a good point. I, I mean, you know, far be it from me. I mean, maybe he looked at all the different scenarios and thought, oh no, we'd, right. we'd, be, we'd be shooting at each other. Or so I, I don't know, but just yeah. seems to me, just like, throw that out there. <laughs> um, so another th- thing too. So like, I think the real lesson is that somebody, somebody with the, you know, acting like the boy scout, a movie about Ned Flanders would not work. <laughs> right that would be you'd get it go really fast you'd want a homer you know and but so the difference is it's not merely that captain america you know has this upstanding moral code it's that he's super brave and he has all these amazing powers so that's what, and the same thing with superman it's that it's the combination that oh he's got his amazing powers and then it's coupled with you know his upstanding moral code and so i'm thinking of like of the movie um hacksaw ridge have you seen that no. Okay, so that's the Mel Gibson movie about um, the guy's name is Desmond Doss. He was a pacifist who served as a medic in World War II. And it's a fantastic movie. Like, look, you really should go see it. Um, yeah. Or get it. You're not going to go see it. Um, and it's, it's a similar thing where in the beginning, you know, his, like, we pacifist, what, are you kidding me? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just tell the Japanese that we don't believe in guns and we'll be fine, you know, that, you know just making fun of them and mocking them. So, but I don't want to spoil it, but he does some stuff that's incredibly heroic. So then from that point on, nobody's doubting him. Like they, they get like, oh, he re- he's the real deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that's part of it that it's like with Captain America, it's, it's like he proves that, no, I really am living up to these ideals. You know, it's not just like something that I do because I want society to like me. It's like, no, he really is the Boy Scout. Like yeah. in, in other words, if you were really in danger and, or you were about to freeze to death out in the woods, you would want a Boy Scout with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's only in situations where their skills are useless that you make fun of someone for being a Boy Scout. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Larry Reed actually has a really great article about Hacksaw Ridge on Fee.org. Um, and I th- I think there's another important distinction though between Ned Flanders and um, and Captain America, um, and that is that like Ned Flanders is like super you know judgmental, and um, whereas like you know. Captain America and Superman are are not, you know, and and I think I think that touches on one issue that people have with these characters and and why so many um, creators assume that these characters won't do well, and and that is this notion that excellence in itself is judgmental. Um, and so I talk about this in, in my article because there's this one um, Forbes piece that talks about that, that um, you know, DC is struggling to, to make Superman relevant to modern audiences because um, his godlike powers and righteous attitude are alienating for, for modern ad- audiences. And, and I think that assumption is based on um, how we as a society, or at least some sectors of society, have come to look at being super. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I write in my article that that according to a common worldview, many forms of being super are often considered not admirable but suspect, not worthy of emulation but of resentment, not a source of inspiration but of envy. And... um, and so, you know, you, and you see that in like the way that the, the that entrepreneurs and the rich are treated, um, that um, that um, people who you know try to encourage healthy habits and um, and and um, and like just wise habits about like um, you know behaving like you know saving money and working hard and and um, you know, trying to do right by people that, that, you know, those are considered as sort of like, you know, archaic values and, uh, and they're, and they're seen as, 
inherently judgmental. And, and so like a figure like, like Superman, especially who is sort of like a, a symbolic, like platonic representation of like health and strength and virtue and honesty and, and self-restraint and sobriety. And, um, that, you know, that, that is looked on as inherently, um, self-righteous and as inherently judgmental, um, but it doesn't need to be that way. Mm-hmm. It's only a certain worldview that um, that makes it that way. And and it's like, it, and it, it kind of reminds me of the the biblical story of, of of Cain and Abel. That like you know Cain looks at Abel's su- success, and instead of you know treating it, uh, thinking of it as something to to emulate and aspire to, that he resents it and he blames. Um, blames Abel. And, um, and so you see that a lot. And so, so with that kind of worldview, then, then yeah, like uh, a figure like, like Superman, all oh, that's just going to make you feel worse about yourself. And, um, and, and in, in that perspective, like only like a deeply flawed character will, will be acceptable. Well, okay. A lot of great stuff there. Um, for one thing, you've seen Jordan Peterson's lecture on Cain and Abel, right? Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll link to that, folks. It's amazing. And for those who don't know, it's that that Cain destroys that. That's his solution to the you know this the existence yeah. of somebody that's living Spoiler. up to his ideals better than him as he destroys him. Um, mm-hmm. It's funny you're saying that because it's when I was in grad school, I was going through some emotional turmoil, and there was a period where I. I had like a CD player, like old school CD player, and I had the ear, but I'd be riding the subway, and I would play the the soundtrack from the 1978 movie, and like that would get me fired up. So it was far from like, oh no, I could never be that. It was like, no, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> like it yeah. was <laughs> like, come on, all right, you, suck it up, Murphy, let's do this, you know, kind of thing. Um, and then it, it, my wife just brought this on my radar that are you aware of like how Ellen DeGeneres' show is like getting canceled and everything? No, I heard yeah, that. Yeah. She's like the villain of the year and it's this big thing and it was going through and like, you know, there's all kinds of stuff on YouTube about, Oh, she treats her guests poorly. And and I saw literally not a single accusation of something that she was supposed to have done as opposed to like maybe some of the producers she works with and what do they do with the staff or whatever. Uh-huh. But I, to me, I think the big thing was, like she's successful, but the other thing is because her catchphrase was be kind to each other or something like that. Like that's how she would end her show. Mm. And so I think there's this perverse thing where, oh, you're going around telling people to be kind. We got to tear you down. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's so anyway, I thought of that when you were where, because you know, obviously there's plenty of other people in show business who are way worse objectively, both to their staff and to their, you know, the people they work with than she is but they're not going around, you know, because th- that's the thing, like what you were saying, like this idea of someone trying to exhibit excellence, like that's somehow judging people. Like, I think there's this weird thing where someone who goes out of her way to say, hey, everyone, let's be kind to each other. Like that's taken as, what do you mean by that? You know, I, I can do what I want. What, who are you to tell me to be kind? You know, you're not so perfect. Even right. though her point was not to say, hey, you over there, you're not being kind enough. It was more, you know what this world needs right now is more kindness. So it's... Yeah. It's a weird uh, situation. All right. I have you for, you can go, what, another 10 minutes at least? Sure. All yeah. right. Superman versus Batman. Go ahead. I don't want to, I don't want to bias it. What, what do you think? <laughs> you mean in a fight or? or no, no, as- no, 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 no. The movie. Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because, because people hated that movie when it came out. Yeah. So how did you how did you feel? Yeah, I I also um, I mean it was pretty much an, an extension of, of the Man of Steel. I mean it even like revisits the um, the carnage in right. Metropolis uh, from from Man of Steel um, from Batman Bruce Wayne's perspective, and and that's what sets up um, you know the conflict between the two heroes, and um, and. I, I think that they, you know, pretty much continued to get the Superman character all wrong in the same way. I think they also got the Batman character all wrong too. Um because even though he is brooding, 
I think in some way he's he's closer, like the classic Batman is closer to Superman than to Iron Man. Okay. Um, that um, he's because he also, at least in the comics um, and, and in the animated series from the 90s, just never kills. Like he's just far right. none right. kills. Mm-hmm. He doesn't use guns. Um, and he's also like an omnicompetent character. Like, like you, you don't, um, like he's, he's not super, he's not like literally superhuman, but you know, he's a master detective. He's a master martial artist. He's, he's just like, he's like a pinnacle of what a mere human like could attain Mm. through just like, you know, self-control and self-discipline. Did you see the thing, Dan, um, it was Batman versus Darth Vader. Did you see that? No. Oh, I got to send it to you. It's awesome. So <laughs> it's it, it's like it, it it's it's very well done. Like like technically, like the you know it, it looks real. Even though I don't know if it, like fans just made it, but the idea is it's a it's a world where it's the Star Wars and DC worlds overlapping, and so yeah. Darth Vader has somehow captured Superman and he's being held on the on like the death star in a cell that has, you know, like a kryptonite thing. And then Batman has to go rescue him. Yeah. And so it's a, well, I'll I'll go ahead and spoil it. So there's a a way, like they have alternate endings so you can see whatever you want to see. But the scenario in which Batman's able to beat Darth Vader, even though Vader has like the force and stuff. And so you think like, can he just choke? And it was funny in the YouTube comments, people were arguing like, come on, Darth Vader. And, the defenders of Batman were saying, no, the deal with Batman is he would never allow himself to be in a situation where he wasn't going to win. Right. So yes, there are scenarios where he would lose, but he would just make sure he wouldn't be there. You know? <laughs> so it was like, that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that raises another issue too. Another sort of like deconstruction, uh, deconstruction of, of the classic hero is what they've done to Luke Skywalker in, in the star Wars mm-hmm. uh, franchise that like even Mark Hamill himself, uh, remark that that the, the things that he does in the in the more recent movies like that's just not him that's not the character right yeah, yeah. I think his exact words were that's not my Luke Skywalker yeah mm-hmm. yeah that that Luke Skywalker like you know it's like it's like a coming of age story so he definitely evolves and develops and and, and gets better but but there's there's like a co- a core um, earnestness and heroism that he maintains throughout that ultimately redeems his fallen father. Um, and, and then, so to, to basically like undo that. And then he's just like cynical and, um, you know, just throws his lightsaber over, over a cliff, like, Oh, just, just like, let's, you know, let's the, the, the evil empire like re-rise and just like, it's not my responsibility to, to, to fight it. And, and, you know, catastrophically fails in, 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 in raising, um, um, his, his protege. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's just really indicative of, of what creators think is necessary for hero storytelling. And it just isn't because, like even even to the degree that these characters are unrealistically perfect, it's like realism isn't everything. Like stories are symbolic, and mm. um, you know just like the, the way myths are, and and they serve functions beyond just reflecting exactly what we see in in, in real life. That that you know that that they that they that they represent principles and ideas that that watching them, you know, makes us uh, understand parts of ourselves better from, from watching it. And even though like, you know, obviously we're never going to be, have the powers of a Kryptonian and we're never going to be even as perfect a, a, as Batman, but it provides a symbolic ideal, uh, a, a representation of, of human excellence to always strive for, even though you never quite attain it. Right. Yeah. Well said. Um, and also, to, you said something earlier about that. That okay. Well, earlier you were saying how society needs rescuing right now, or something like that, and yeah. like we need a Superman. You know, like by the way, how do you feel about this? I I think the reason all these superhero like, back up. There's a definite trend in the last ten years, let's say, of people going to 
superhero movies and zombie apocalypse movies. And I don't <laughs> think that's a coincidence. I think the public kind of knew this is not going well. Like, like we we're going to, you know, society is going to collapse and we need heroes to rise up when that happens because this is not going well. Do you, do you think I'm nuts or you think that there's something? No, I, I think, I think that is really true. And I think that, that that's a pattern because again, Superman, Superman was basically the first superhero. Like he was the first, you know, with the costume and the secret identity and, and, um, you know, fighting crime. And, um, like he he was the first archetypal superhero and he emerged in like you know in 1938 at the height of the great depression i don't know if it's like actually the height but it was you know really bad then and um and i think that he he was created by his creators because that was the kind of figure that 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 they found inspiring mm -hmm. uh, amid everything that was going on, and it was a hit with the public because it was inspiring with everything that was going on, and um, and and in the same way that I think it's no coincidence that you know the superhero movies that they, they've been going strong for twenty years now, like it really like X Men, the first X Men uh, in the year two thousand, um, you you know kind of started it all off. And um, and I don't think it's any coincidence that like you know shortly after that, 9/11 happened, and and like ever since then like the superhero movies keep getting steam, gaining steam like throughout throughout the wars that followed that, throughout the um, the financial uh, crash of 2007 2008, the Great Recession after that, um, and all the way through like you know. A lot of people considered, you know, Trump as traumatic a, a, as anything else, um, and and then everything that's going now in 2020, um, that that, you know, in times like that, we need that symbolic representation of hero heroism to understand what heroism is, so that we can live up to it, because that's what the times call for. Yeah, and and I the reason I want to have you reemphasize re that is because I remember. When I was in grad school, I, I got back into a Superman kick. I, well, I told you like that. I was using it to like psych myself up and, you know, get yeah. fired up, you know, to go into NYU or whatever. And uh, and that, and somebody gave me pushback. Like I wrote articles for LRC or something. And somebody gave me pushback like, you know, over email or something. Like, oh, no, uh, we don't. Like for one thing, they didn't like Superman because he was like a goody two-shoes bootlicker, whereas Batman was a cool, you know what I mean? In other words, like Superman... Mm -hmm. And in the movies, yeah, like he goes and puts the the flag back in the White House or something, and you know what I mean. Like he's he's certainly working with the system. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, whereas Batman was like, you know, the Dark Knight who doesn't work, he works out. So, like, oh, he, you know, if you're going to be libertarian, then Batman's your guy, not Superman. So that's what the thing. But beyond that, they were they didn't like the idea because I had written things along the lines of what you were saying that like this is a good figure to like to inspire people. And I was like, oh no, we don't comic books are dumb or, or superhero movies are dumb because it teaches people that to solve problems, they need, you know, this external savior to come in and rescue them as opposed mm -hmm. to solving problems themselves. So they thought it like sowed the seeds for statism and stuff like that. Like we need an FDR to come in or we need an Obama because the Superman movies have taught us when the times get tough, we need this superhuman person to come in. So how would you respond to that kind of a critique? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some portrayals that have trended in, in that direction, e even from the beginning that like um, the, the 1938 Superman, he was very much sort of like a new deal type character that, mm. um, um, that he was, um, there's even w one story where he, um, he destroys these slums um, in order to stimulate the government to rebuild it better. <laughs> uh -huh. And, um, and th there's, there's lots of, there's lots of elements like that. And, um, but I, I don't, I don't think that at, as Superman ev ev evolved into like what became the classic, like Superman in, in the public imagination, um, that it, it represents that. I, I think that, I think that Superman doesn't represent an other. I think he represents like the best in us. Um, 
that, you know, especially, especially the Clark Kent Superman dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, um, you know, I, I, I really, res it's probably why I love, um, the, the Superman movies when I, when I was a kid, like I, I my, I, I distinctly remember just being like so inspired by the part in Superman two, where after he had lost his powers, um, and, um, and then he had been bullied, um, by, by this you know, trucker in a, in a yeah. diner. Your seat's in there, four eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then he, he you know he got beat up because he he didn't have his powers and and then um and then you see him come back at the end when he gets his power back and and he stands up to the bully um and and that's funny you know, I've never seen garbage eat garbage before I, I may <laughs> have seen that movie 30 times just to go ahead. wow yeah <laughs> i don't even remember that line awesome um and yeah that i mean i mean I, I was kind of a nerdy kid and I was really, you know, bookish and, and, and slight. And, um, and so, so this notion of, of like a really like, you know, nerdy character like Clark Kent having this inner strength, um, that, um, is something that is really symbolic that, that, um, people resonate with. And, and again, it's, it's symbolism. It's not, it, it's not the lesson that like, okay, well, you know, you need to go out and, you know, punch bad guys and, 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 you know, that's the lesson of Superman. It's, it's the symbolic lesson of, of like, you know, you, you may seem, you know, meek and mild mannered and, um, and weak and ineffectual. Um, but you, you have something that people don't realize that, that you, right. that, you know, um, uh, underneath the, that starch shirt, um, c conformity culture that, you know, that there's this, this like heart of gold and this, um, this, this inner potential that is just waiting to, to show itself, to reveal itself and to express itself in the world and to do great things. That's just a really powerful story. Great, great, great. Yeah, I love that. And because that's yeah, the way I explain it to so my son, whose name was Clark, by the way. Um, it was, uh, we were watching it. I was showing him because, yeah, I, I loved the the, the acting. Because the, in the old, the, the black and white one, where I told you where, you know, Superman sitting like this and bullets. Are, but that Clark Kent was kind of cocky too in yeah. that one. And I didn't think that, was, I mean, so I got that, but I didn't like that as much as, the you know is is Richard Donner was he the director of the yeah seventy eight one mm -hmm. that one I thought was perfect where Clark is like nerdy and whatever and like you know this glass because it's partly because he's got to throw off suspicion right like in other words to make sense gee he kind of does look just like Superman with glasses on doesn't he <laughs> you know mm -hmm. like like he has to act totally like not like a Superman would or whatever mm -hmm. whereas we take there's something I need to tell you Lois and all of a sudden you know his voice changes but um, yeah. so. So that, that, yeah, like I was explaining to him, like the reason he can act that goofy and like let, you know, Lois kind of walk all over him at work or whatever and let, you know, coworkers, you know, oh, is this elevator going up? And, you know, people yelling at him and he's, oh, oh, oh. it's because deep, because he knows, by the way, I'm Superman. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, in other words, he can let that stuff go because he knows, yeah, I'm Superman. So yeah. it's, I don't need to win this argument with this guy because I'm Superman, you know? And so, and, and, and I don't need to show you that I am right now because you just yelled at me and I have to catch the next elevator. When will I show the world who I am? Oh, when it's important. Like when Lois is going to die, that's when I will reveal myself. Exactly. Because the audience is knowing, no, oh yeah, that's why he's... So in other words, they don't sit there thinking, man, Clark really needs to stand up for himself because they're like, no, he, no he's, he's Superman. He was, wait, he'll do it when the, you know, anyway. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, okay. Last thing I want to ask you is... Oh, by the way, so with the DC, the Superman versus Batman, I agree that that wasn't a great movie. And my two problems, like, so one was, like you were saying, the motivations were a little off, but um, Super, Superman was stupid in that. In other words, Batman should not have got, gotten the upper hand on him like that. Like, I think they needed to do more. So I agree, the Batman character, if he's going to fight Superman, he would come up with some way that he would win. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't think they did a good enough job of that like super, they made Superman just be an idiot in that so that's my yeah. concern however the, I, there was some like I heard people complaining about that like oh for most of the movie like the fight doesn't even happen until the end and that seemed dumb I was like 
well, gee, in Rocky, most of the movie is him training uh-huh. and they don't fight to the end. Like that's right. If, if Batman and Superman are going to fight to the death, there's got to be some development because they're both good guys. Like they need, you know, so anyway, so some of the criticism with that was goofy. Okay. So the last thing is why is it in your opinion that the Marvel movies are just, just crushed in the DC franchise? They don't know what they're doing. Like they can't, like somebody put it, I, I forget the exact words, but it was like, uh, the Marvel, they make a movie about a, what was it? It's not a squirrel. What, what's from the Guardians of the Galaxy? What's the little guy? Raccoon. Yeah. They can make a movie about a talking raccoon and it's awesome. And the DC is like hoping Wonder Woman doesn't bomb. Like that's weird. And yeah. yet that was the situation. So what? how do you feel about that? Um, I wonder if part of it is Marvel, their, their trouble with copyright. Because um, a long time ago, Marvel had um, just really recklessly um, sold off their their rights to uh, to their big the, their biggest name characters, um, and you know not realizing how how valuable that, mm-hmm. that they would be, and and so so that's why like there's all sorts of like legal wrangles o- over the characters, and that's why you have like different studios doing like having different uh, universes that there's right. like, there's the X-Men franchise, which is completely separate from the Marvel cinematic universe. And, um, and then there's still other um, franchises. And, um, and I think that there's an element of competition that that's, that's been driven uh, by, by that, um, by the fact that it, it wasn't quite, quite so monopolized um, because ultimately I think that's what the problem is with um especially with with superman and and with the dc characters in general um is is copyright um i think that i think that um you know myths were able to evolve and be like distilled to be like perfect for their time and place and for the, for their culture because it was basically in the public domain and so you know so people like were able to tell their own versions of the sto- of, of of these classic stories, and um, through the attrition of time, um, only you know the best elements of each story would survive the test of time. And so then, like after you know several generations, um, or like many generations, you'd eventually have like this distilled, like perfect, um, like literally perfect, but just like really high quality, um, myth that really, that really spoke to people that really resonated with people. And, um, and so, but, but with copyright, it's like, it's monopolized that, you know, that, that DC has it. And, and if, and if DC gets it wrong, then we're just out of luck that there's no competition. Nobody can, nobody can have their alternate take that, that might, you know, catch fire with the audiences that, 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 um, that shows how to do this character properly. Like they, they're just free to just bungle a, a, as long as they want. And, um, and so I, I think, I think that ultimately that's, that's the problem. Okay. So you, that's interesting. You're trying to like give like the systemic explanation. I'm being more like, I don't know, t- <laughs> tactical or something. Like, I think, to me, the the fundamental difference in terms of why does the one franchise like just worse? They keep hitting it out of the park, and the other one does, is the Marvel ones are fun. Like the yeah. movies are just fun, and I think casting uh, Robert Downey Jr. was was a brilliant move. Like I think that kind of set the pattern, and they realized like yes, that's the right blend of like in other words, the, the movies are are serious. Like like this is real. Like they're like we're really pretending that you know all these super people exist and have these mutant powers and stuff but we're having fun with it because we know, yeah, we're having grownups go and watch a comic book movie. Like, it's got to be funny. And whereas with the DC, it was just real dark and somber and serious. Yeah. And I just think that, like, you couldn't be, you, you, you can't just be sad and serious for two hours. Like, no, I need this to be kind of light and fast-paced. I, I, I totally agree with that. I think the Marvel movies, that they're just balanced, that that they have, they have serious moments too, and mm-hmm. they, they touch on um, you know, uh, um, ideas and, and controversies that, that, that apply to like our real world, uh, in contemporary times. Um, but, but they also, um, have 
they're also fun and funny and have jokes and and they also have just like adventure and and just like you know less serious adventure and and more kind of um just like happy glorious uh heroics um and um and yeah so it's just it's just a better uh, a better experience how much time do you have because i had one other one if you got time sure yeah okay. I have time. when you were explaining it occurred to me like what you think they they got wrong with superman and how they decided oh let's take it in the direction of like crippling him and whatever i did notice some of that in the marvel ones specifically with uh i guess infinity war and what is it the end game is that what it was called mm-hmm. where um they maybe yeah with, with the like they kind of took the hulk and thor out of commission like yeah. the, well i guess what was it infinity war where the hulk gets beaten up in the beginning am i getting the movies right is that yeah. the one where it starts up and the Hulk's ready to go and then Thanos just kicks the crap out of him? Yes. And then so he gets zoomed back. And then the Hulk just is hiding. Like it's got to be, uh, you know, Banner in the Iron Man suit or something because the Hulk won't even come out. So that right. was, and I, I guess, I, were they trying to show like the Hulk's never really been beaten up before and so he's immature? Or like, okay, fine. And maybe like for the plot development, it's kind of like, well, the Hulk's so strong, we kind of need to take him out otherwise unless Thanos is literally in the scene, the Avengers always win. I don't know if that was the reason for it, but they did that. And then of course, Thor getting, you know, the dad bod in the next one and being all, you know, whiny and stuff. So how did you feel? Did you think they were making a similar mistake or did you think it worked there in those applications? Well, I I think that, um, I think that it is regrettable in a lot of ways. I, I think that they're able to afford to do that because they have so many um, other characters to fill the, the traditional heroic roles. Um, but I, I do think that, that um, especially, especially Thor, because like with his arc, he, um, you know, he, in, in the first movie, he was kind of, it was kind of like a, like a Henry the fourth kind of thing, like an irresponsible, how like, you know, b- becomes, becomes a responsible uh, adult and, and like um, lives up to, to the throne that, that he's supposed to inherit to, from his, from his Royal father. Um, and, and where he learns to be a hero and, um, and he, you know, there's this line of like, you know, that's what, that's what heroes do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and even in, in Ragnarok, like you, you know, you see him, like in spite of Valkyrie's like really intense cynicism, like he, he is like a huge contrast to that. It's like, no, like you, you can't just wallow in alcoholism and, and give up, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, as bad as things look, you know, and this is after he had already lost his hammer. He had been like, had his short, hair shorn like Samson and, and he's still, um, you know, he's still like not giving up and he's like super stalwart. He's still Thor. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but then they just kept grinding him down with just tragedy after tragedy. And eventually it becomes like really, it just becomes bad storytelling. It's like, it's, it's, it's one thing for, you know, you know, for, for the uncle Ben to die, but then to like, you know, it's, it kind of reminds me of Harry Potter. It's just like, okay, like Harry Potter had his like, um, you know, original formative like tragedy in, in, in his life, but then they kept like compounding all the tragedies, like where it's like every every you know father figure like that he comes across in his life, it's like okay, they kill him off too, and and it just it just becomes gratuitous after a certain point, and I, and I think that's what what happened with Thor, and and you know it was funny like the the mm-hmm. you know the the Big Lebowski version of Thor like. Mm-hmm. You know, Hemsworth is 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 a really funny actor, and he did he did a really good job with that. Um, but yeah, the blubbering uh, it, it it did go it it went too far, and um, and and I think that especially given like you know the the the, the previous arc that like you know there, there's only there's only so much that like you can have like you know repetitions of the same arc of like. You know, he already had his, you know, um, you know, abandoning irresponsibility and, and embracing, 
responsibility. And so just to have him just like, you know, recycle that and have to relearn the same lessons over again, it's just, it's, it's not, it, it doesn't serve the function, that story that of, of like sort of the, the, um, the developmental and edifying and educational function that, that hero stories are, um, are supposed to have. Right. Right. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Uh, so folks, my guest has been Dan Sanchez and for links to all the stuff we've been talking about, we'll go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 141. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. It was great to talk with you, Bob. Thank you. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.